Bom dia, galera do Brasil. Hello to everybody else from all over the world. So we're gonna wait a little bit for people to start joining in and I'm gonna leave you guys with a video talking about our digital atlas, okay? so nice to see you all joining me here this morning morning here in Brazil in Brazil it's 10 a.m. I hope you guys appreciate everything I'm gonna show and share with you guys today so it's gonna be all about uh, showing videos uh, about uh, challenging cases that I faced during the years so this first part of the webinar will be about uh, surface disease 
and then we're gonna do a second part maybe next week about intraocular disease okay it's very good to see former students here a lot of people that are doing the FACO emulsification course with me Cristina uh, Dr. Carol Barbosa it's very good to have you guys here so uh, during the presentation I'm gonna ask you guys to leave your uh, questions in the chat room and then at the end of the presentation I'm gonna do the uh, questions and answers part okay I'm gonna wait a little bit more for people to start joining we have 40 people already so it's gonna be very nice Dr. Pedro, always good to see you here, man. Just tell me if the, the sound is good, if the streaming is good. Croatia. Hello there. I see Dr. Cristina Roverati here also. Flavio Miranda. Daniela Palkowski. Dr. Fernanda Ferrari. Hello to everyone. There are some people that I cannot dare to say the name because it's have all different accents and all. We're gonna try it. Dr. Civicat Osvirel, is that correct or close? <laughs> Sound okay, okay, okay. Dr. Caio, Dr. Gustavo Castro. Good. So it's about 10.06. We're gonna wait a couple minutes more and then we're gonna start, okay? Dr. Victoriana. Oh, that was correct. Thank you. <laughs> I try hard, okay? <laughs> Good. Dr. Cynthia Stoko, welcome. Dr. Raissa, welcome. Nice, we have 50 people already. So for those of you guys that doesn't know me, I'm Dr. João Alfredo Kleiner from VetWeb Veterinary Ophthalmology here in Curitiba, so, uh, Paraná State, South Brazil. And I have been practicing uh, veterinary ophthalmology for 22 years already and I have a lot of videos and a lot of pictures, a lot of cool cases that I want to share with you guys during this quarantine period 
So this is going to be the first uh, part of the, our webinars. And this one is going to be about the surface disease. So we're about to start. Let me just put the PowerPoint here and we're going to start, okay? Dr. Marcelo Freire, welcome. Dr. Lana. So we are about to start. I'm just setting up the presentation here, okay? Dr. Marcelo Freire, welcome. Dr. Lana. Yeah, that's a picture, Gustavo, of the iguana eye. It's a friend's iguana. Stands still very good for, for pictures. <clears throat> so we're going to start the webinar. So we're going to talk today about challenging cases in veterinary ophthalmology. This is going to be part one, okay? So the first case I'm going to share with you guys, probably some people there are watching here already saw in a Congress last year here in Curitiba, but I'm going to share with everybody else. So this is a two year old Peking G's dog. Uh, had a previous uh, corneal perforation after a dog fight. History of a one day that happened. And no matter is very recent, the trauma, we already start having some cornea melting in progress. So the first option for us was the corneal scleral conjunctival transposition because it, it has uh, the best transparency on the long run. But you guys, in the, during the video, are going to appreciate that there was no way to do corneal sutures. So we had to switch to another graft, another technique. So I'm going to start the video here and I'm going to talk through the video. So dog's name is Luit two-year-old picking pecking G's. So the dog is under anesthesia already. This is the right eye. We have some uh, fur rubbing on the corner surface and this is the, the eye that had trauma 24 hours before this video. So a lot of inflammation already. This is fibrin coming out of the anterior chamber. So we start to have a lot of uh, issues in the eye, inflammation, meiosis. This is part of the iris tissue here. And you can see there is a little bit of corneal haze. So as soon as we remove the fibrin, 
tissue, we have aqueous humor flowing out the eye. And this is the defect we need to deal with. So we start uh, marking the area, thinking about doing the corneal scleral transposition, but you can appreciate that no matter the lesion is 24 hours old, we start having a lot of corneal melting already. So we barely touch the cornea and the cornea tissue just falls apart very easy. So you see, the epithelium just is sloughing off. We're still thinking about the corneal scleral transposition. Removing a little bit of the tissue that is fragile in the area. So there is no way for us to put stitches in this cornea. So after the brightening of the region, we switch off to amniotic membrane. So those membranes we preserve, we obtain, we harvest the membranes after cesarean in uh, female dogs, and then after washing it off in saline solution, we store it inside a jar full of. Uh, 98% glycerin and you, you can leave in the shelf okay and right before using for grafts you wash it off with saline solution again and then you cut little pieces and you spread all over the cornea just like a napkin if you're using uh, amniotic membranes from uh, female dogs, you'd better do two or three layers because they are very thin. If you are lucky to have amino acid membranes from uh, large animals, you can use only one layer, okay? So the good thing about this procedure is that you don't have to suture and anchor the graft in the cornea. You can anchor the graft around the bulbar conjunctiva okay so let's watch it so this is the first layer of the amniotic membrane the first layer is the hardest one to put in so just opening the first layer graft and then here we, you can use a 7-0 suture and anchor the amino acid membrane 360 degree on the bulbar conjunctiva. So the, the first layer is the trickiest one. If you guys have any questions, please just uh, put in the chat and then at the end of, or maybe at the end of this first case, we can answer the, the questions, okay? So you see that I'm using a continuous pattern. Passing through the bulbar conjunctiva near the limbus and this is the second layer and you can suture the second and the third layer together and the third layer
make sure we would remove those uh, bubbles, air bubbles that forms here. Okay, just like the first layer, you do the second and third layer. Suturing on the bulbar conjunctiva. Just like so. So this is right at the end of the procedure. We're gonna do a third eyelid flap just to protect the area of the surgery. And you leave the third eyelid flap protecting the corneal surface for at least 10 days. So I believe everybody knows the technique for doing a 30 eyelid flap. Just hold on a minute that my PowerPoint just crashes here, just a little bit. I'm gonna start it over again, sorry. I have some issues here with the technology. I'll be back in a few minutes, okay? Just starting over the PowerPoint presentation here. Sorry, guys. If you have any questions, please just put there. Diana asking about the suture material. This is a 7-0 Vipro, okay, with sharp needle. So let's try again here the presentation. Technology is against me this morning. Gustavo is asking about the second uh, layer of the amniotic membrane. Yes, we fixed the second and the third layer together. So it's quite, quite a nice technique. I hope you guys start using that. I know that a lot of people that are watching it already use this and Dr. Pedro is asking about the epithelium is facing the cornea. Considering that uh, it's a tectonic graft, it's just for uh, helping the <clears throat> healing of the cornea there's doesn't matter which way okay gifted hands uh, does the amniotic membrane require any pros processing and decellularization before preserving an application of it as a graft no you just wash it off with saline solution and put straight inside a jar filled with 98% uh, glycerin. Okay, just that. There are different techniques to preserve amniotic membranes. You can cryo it. Humans cry, have the, the cryo to store it. And they freeze the membrane on the very low temperature. 
but for us it's easier to do to do just like I showed you guys okay So technology is back, let's try again. Katerina is asking why is it important to remove the bubbles between the amino acid layers? Because if you do not do so, you're gonna have uh, they tear off easily okay so you'd better do that otherwise you can just fall off quicker so Michelle Barbosa is asking about the treatment afterwards we're gonna talk about that at the end of the video okay So looks like we have in a, let me show the video a little different for you guys. See how can I do that? Michelle Barbosa, we'll be talking about that. Let's see if I can show you the video in other way for you guys because the PowerPoint is crashing. Any other questions in the meanwhile? So let's see here guys, almost there, almost there, be patient, we don't have anything else to do besides stay at home and learn. So a few more seconds. There you go, there you go. There you go. Good. So this is the third eye in the flap. Everybody knows the technique. The first uh, bite in the third eyelid, you go from the inside to the outside, and then this one uh, no penetrating bite and then you go from the outside to the inner part and then go through the upper eyelid so this is easy everybody knows that you can put some kind of uh, material to protect the skin okay and leave it for like 10 days So this is uh, 20 days post-op, okay? We have a uh, very good corner transparency already. The eye is calm, is visual. And we have a little bit of scar tissue here. And you're gonna see there is a little cornea ulcer right in there because the patient went for grooming and the groomer hit the dog's eye with a comb and made this ulcer, little ulcer here. But you see the corneal transparency is very good. There's a little cyanica here. So this is 20 days, okay? So let's see a little bit more long run. So this is 45 days 
post op, a little bit of corneal haze, there's no synechia anymore, the pupil is free, the eye is visual and calm. So a very nice result for this technique. So I hope you guys have started using that. And it's easy to do, just like you saw in this video, and easy to store the amniotic membrane, and the outcome is very good. So let's answer some questions about this case. Uh, amniotic membrane of which animal is used from female dogs? Palavi Kelkar, have you used any other material like seas? Any comparison of one material with the others in your experience? Yes, uh, I have used, I think, everything that is available in the market already. So, the reason that I showed this technique for you guys is because it's easy to obtain the membranes and it's cheap. Uh, Small intestinal submucosas, the biosis is nice also, but in my opinion, we have much more scar tissue than with a amniotic membrane. So we have a lot of stuff to do grafts, okay? So this is just one technique that I showed you guys. It's easy to do, easy to store the amniotic membrane, and you have a very good outcome, okay? Dr. Caio is asking, where can I get amniotic membranes here in Sao Paulo? Just do a cesarean in a female dog and you have it. Or ask a friend that does cesareans every time and ask them to save for you. Any more questions about this first case? Pedro is saying that I would be afraid to use a amniotic membrane in such a big hole without suturing it around the defect. Yeah, in this case, just like you saw, uh, there is no way to put sutures in the cornea. So, different technique for this patient, you know, you gotta have different uh, weapons to fight this this fight you know there is a lot of different roads to reach the, the a good outcome so this one was a uh, the road that we decided to take nine eight percent glycerin yes that that's it Fernando Ferrari why did you prefer cover all eye with the membrane and not only the perforation. Could you suture where there is in cornea melting? Uh, considering that uh, the cornea was very fragile all over, all over the defect, like around the defect and almost all around the, the, the eye, we decided not to put any suture in the cornea. Uh, so the history was a 24 hours history after the trauma and if you have a cornea melting that fast you should avoid put any suture material in the cornea and you should think about any other procedure that do not require anchoring the suture in the cornea okay So, Jelena Oksana, ok, Oksa, where do you buy it? It is possible that we will leak. We, I not. This is fresh amniotic membrane. This is this is a membrane obtained after C-section, okay? After cesarean in a female dog. You're welcome, Fernanda. Any more questions? So just like I told you guys before, there are a lot of uh, good techniques to use in this particular case, okay? So in this case, you should avoid suturing the cornea 
because it's too fragile. So you can do a lot of different techniques, but make sure you put the sutures on the bow bar conjunctiva, okay? Can we go to the next case? So Dr. Uh, Jelena, I mean, can the eye leak aqueous? Yeah, probably so for a some some for a while, you know. After a while, the iris just plug it off the hole, and there's no leakage anymore. Have you used this technique in other dog perforations? Yeah, I have. Do you think you would have the same result by using the biases? Meh, hard to tell. I think biases will have much more scar tissue than aminoacid membrane. The glycerin you buy in a at least here in Brazil, you buy in a pharmacy, regular pharmacy. Make sure it's 9-8% uh, glycerin. How many sutures you did in this case? I don't know, a lot. It's a continuous pattern. No, the suture is continuous, all around 360 degrees, all around the bulbar conjunctiva, okay? So we're gonna jump to the next case. This is a 10 months old Shih Tzu. Had a, have a, mass, a massive anterior staphyloma. Has a previous uh, history of corner ulcer when he was a puppy. I think it was like a two or three months with a superficial ulcer that was not well managed by the other veterinarian and the epithelial does just grew over the defect and we had a very nasty staphyloma so I'm gonna show you guys how we manage this case so anterior corneal staphyloma with epithelization in a 10 months old Shih Tzu in this case, we did corner scleral conjunctival transposition. This is a nice footage because we have the image from the microscope outside the microscope. This is the caliper just measuring how much tissue we're gonna take it off. So this is our surgical microscope with the camera. And this is the defect. I'm gonna stop a little bit the video here for you guys to appreciate. So this is uh, iris tissue, okay? And it's covered with epithelium. That's why if you put fluorescein here, will not stain because there's no uh, stroma To absorb the fluorescein okay so this is a very fragile area very thin uh, corneal tissue here just epithelium covering the iris tissue that's out this, this black part here so in order to restore the full thickness of this part of the eye and give the the dog a very good transparency in this region, it's right by the visual axis. The best procedure in this case is corneal scleral transposition. Okay, so this is the, the best uh, transparency you're gonna achieve. This is uh, more tricky, it is a more advanced technique than the, um, the other, the former one that I show you guys. And 
we start by marking the area that we're gonna remove the tissue and then we do the the brightening of the cornea tissue and the iris the, all the adherences here and then we slide the health cornea over the defect that we create and suture it okay so let's watch the video So this is a diamond blade just to mark the area and now we are using a crescent diamond blade so you gotta have a, a lot of training to do this technique for sure so this is the cornea that we're taking out over the defect this is all the the synechia. you have to remove all these adherences and we're reaching the limbus okay so make sure you go very deep here in order not to rip it off put a little bit, bit of viscoelastic solution over the anterior lens capsule this is a lens capsule here already Okay, so we got to be careful not to touch it, otherwise we're going to have a cataract later on. So this is the limbus here, a little bit of the sclera, and then we're separating the conjunctiva, the bulbar conjunctiva, okay? So we're just making sure the defect is all covered with the, the cornea without tension. Now, we're doing the debridement of the this vitalized iris tissue here that's important to do that we do that till we reach a sound tissue we know when it happens when you have bleeding just like that you don't have to worry about the bleeding okay So you can use a saline solution mixed with uh, epinephrine, just like you see here. So you're breaking off all the cyanica, very careful, very gentle, okay? So you have all the cyanica breaking off, and then we're gonna suture back and slide over the defect a healthy cornea. There's a lot of ways to suture it. I like to do a couple of uh, simple interrupted sutures and then I do a continuous pattern among them. You can use a 8-0-9-0 nylon and remove it after the healing period usually we remove it after three to four weeks so continuing the suture here so this is the end of the suture okay you can appreciate all the stitches on the cornea and now we're gonna reinflate the anterior chamber with uh, balanced salt solution and at the same time you're gonna check for leakages okay that's what i'm doing now so there's no leakage at all okay everything is holding in place again 30 lead flap just to protect the cornea you can use bandage contact lenses if you prefer. So you leave the third eye flap covering the corner for at least 10 days. So this is easy. That's what's for the third ID flap, just to protect the area, okay? So this is the final aspect. 
and this is two months after the surgery. You see how nice the transparency all around the defect is, mainly here in the visual axis. So after the healing period, after like a, a month or so, you start using topical steroids here in order to have a better transparency. Okay, and the other important part of this procedure is you have uh, the thickness of the cornea is just like it was before the trauma, okay? So a very good transparency, the eye is calm, visual, there's no cynica anymore. Okay, that, that was it about this case. We're gonna entertain some questions and then we're gonna go to the other case, okay? Let me switch off to the webcam. So let's see, uh, let's start reading the questions here. In the first and second case, have you used atropine to make mitriasis? Ah. Uh, we used uh, midriacil for at least uh, seven days, just that. Thanks, Pedro. Any questions about this second case? So this uh, webinar will be available for you guys to watch again, okay? in my YouTube channel. No more questions? Can you move over to the other case? About the loss of the limbus area, we will not have uh, future problems. No, not at all. There's a scar tissue forming there, so there's no problem at all. Dr. Seveket, was there any uveitis post-op? A little bit. So usually we use uh, topical antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, midriacil for at least five to seven days, and no steroidal anti-inflammatory drops, okay? After the healing period, it happens usually three to four weeks, you put the dog under anesthesia, remove the stitches and start uh, topical corticosteroids, okay? Would it be advisable to insert TPA in order to prevent fiber in the position. Uh, if you want to use that, you can use it. I'm not a TPA lover anymore because it's a drug that just don't have a residual re uh, effect. So as soon as you inject it, it's gonna help to remove the, the fiber and everything else but the fibrin is gonna build up again because the inflammation and the surgical trauma is still there. So it's much more important to use uh, topical anti-inflammatory drugs than the, the TPA in my opinion, okay? It is possible to perform the surgery without an operating microscope. In this case, no. A corneal scleral transposition, you need training and you need a surgical microscope. You can do the, the first case that we showed, the amniotic membrane, you can do with your bare eyes because you're gonna put the stitches uh, on the bulbar conjunctival, but not this one. This one you need training and you need a surgical microscope. Thank you, Dr. Raissa. <laughs> Can we move over to the other case? Any other questions? So 
So let's see the other case. Switch off the PowerPoint again. So the other case is a four year old American Bulldog. Had a recurrent third eyelid gland prolapse. Had three surgeries by other vets before it was referred to me, okay? And the gland tissue was viable. So the therapeutic plan in those cases, you have two choices. Uh, suture anchor around the ventral rectus muscle because they tried three times the Morgan pocket technique already. So we, we've got to switch the technique. Or you can do the or you can do the third eyelid gland autograft. In this case, we decide to do the suture anchor around the hectus, ventral hectus muscle, okay? So you take the, the third eyelid gland and suture it around the ventral rectus muscle. This is very good technique when you have uh, recurrences with the Morgan pocket technique and it's a very good technique. I think it's a first choice technique for large animals. Okay, so let's watch the video of this technique. So the instruments you're gonna use in this surgery are those listed here. Gas muscle hook. This is a special instrument for you to pass the suture around the ventral rectus muscle. Eyelid speculum, a baby bacalus. Number 15 scalpel blade. Iris scissors. Needle holder. Uh, a delicate tissue forceps, just like a colibri forceps, and a 5-0 nylon suture. In this technique, we do not use absorbable suture. You gotta use inabsorbable suture. So the suture of choice is a 5-0 nylon suture, okay? So the first step is the incision of the gland on the medial aspect of the third eyelid. So the third eyelid is it retracted this way, okay? This is the inner part of the third eyelid. And this is the gland that, is, that was prolapsed. Uh, you take your baby bacalus and put on each side of the third eyelid to have tension on it and it's easier to cut through the third eyelid to make the, the incision, okay? So just do the incision over the gland. And we dissect the conjunctiva over the third eyelid. All, our, all around the third eyelid gland, okay? Make sure you go superficial with this dissection. You don't wanna harm the gland. So again, this is the third eyelid retracted with bacals and we are separating the gland from the third eyelid. There is a little bit of the cartilage here on the top of the gland that we have to remove. So you do this dissection till the third eyelid is mobile. The third eyelid gland is mobile, okay? This is a little bit of the third eyelid cartilage that we remove, usually 
it comes out during the dissection of the gland okay so you remove it and you take your gas muscle hook and pass around the insertion the insertion of the ventral rectus okay so this is the gas hook you see that uh, there is a little hole here in the tip of the the hook so this is where you're gonna pass the suture material okay so this is the ventral part again this is the uh, ventral rectus muscle and I'm gonna pass the suture around it so you pass the gas hook there you go now you pass the suture through the hole and around the muscle. You take your suture material and go through the gland using a U pattern. Okay? So you pass, you give one bite, put the gland in the ventral fornix, and then tight your knot don't go very hard with this this knot okay just do a, a gentle a position of the knot very gentle you don't, don't want to rip it off the muscle okay and then you cut the suture and you're done you don't have to suture the conjunctiva anything else okay so this is the final aspect so just one suture, absorbable suture. You don't have to put the e-collar in this procedure, okay? And again, I recommend this procedure for large animals or if you have uh, recurrences with the Morgan pocket technique, okay? Let's see if you have any questions about this case. Any questions about this one? Ah, I forgot to answer Michelle Barbosa about the treat treatment uh, post-operative in the first case. So just antibiotics uh, topical anti-inflammatory drugs and midriacil for five to seven days, okay? Just that. Dr. Michelle Barbosa, is, she's asking, let me put the camera here just a little bit. So Dr. Michelle Bar Barbosa is asking how about anchoring the gland uh, on the orbital rim? It's another technique, am I right? Do you think it could be a good approach as well? Well, this is an old technique. Uh, I don't like this technique because uh, you limited the, the movement of the third eyelid. And you have much more recurrences with the orbital rim uh, anchoring than with, that you have with this, this technique that I showed you guys. So I'm not using the orbital ring uh, anymore because of these issues, okay? Thanks, Gustavo. Yeah, just answer that, Dr. Paliv, about the anchoring on the orbital ring. So I don't like it because it uh, limits the, the movement of the third eyelid. So I, I don't use that anymore. And I, I have had uh, maybe 20 to 30% recurrency with orbital ring technique, so I don't use that anymore. In 30 cases, you use absorbable 
or no absorbable suture. There was no absorbable uh, suture. There was a um, multi-filament uh, nylon. Any other questions about this case? So can we move over to the other one? So this other case is a, is a very cool case. This is a two and a half year old Siberian Husky. Had a primary glaucoma uh, due to a gonio dysgenesis. Uh, the dog was using three or four anti-glaucoma drugs already and the dog was still visual had more vision on the right eye than the left eye i'm sorry more vision on the left eye than the right eye okay so this this is the first day when you got the referral from the other vet in south brazil so this is the first presentation so on the left eye, the intraocular pressure was 22 millimeters of mercury. Okay, the eye was visual, the eye was, was calm. So had gonio dysgenesis in both eyes, but it was compensated, still compensated on the left eye. On the right eye, we had the intraocular pressure 39 millimeters of mercury. The eye was very inflamed, okay, a lot of hyperemia. The pupil was myotic because of the prostaglandin analogs that was being used. So this was the scenario that we were facing the first day. So the gonioscopy that we did, just for comparison, this is a normal uh, trabecular angle, we need a cornea angle, okay? So you can appreciate the trabecular meshwork here. This is a gonio lens to do this kind of exam called gonioscopy. So this is a normal dog, okay? And this is the image of this dog that we are talking about. So you can see there is no angle at all. So this is a angle that was not developed. So the angle is not normal, just like you see here in this other picture, okay? You don't have this drain-like appearance. So there is no, no normal angle here, just a couple of holes to drain the humor aqueous, okay? So on the, this is the left eye. So the therapeutic plane in this case, when you have vision, you have glaucoma and you still have vision, you can choose between those two. You can do an Ahmed valve implant in order to increase the drainage of the aqueous humor and preserve the vision for some months okay or you can do cyclophotocoagulation using the laser diode laser 810 okay so those are the two options we talked to the client about those options 
we talk to the client about the outcome of those procedures and they decide what to do okay in this case considering the costs I had valve implant is uh, more expensive than the laser we did a secret photocoagulation so this is the technique to do the transscleral secret photocoagulation So the objective is to lower the intraocular pressure by destroying areas of the ciliary body using the laser. This is an image of Dr. Leandro Teixeira from Coplo in uh, Wisconsin and shows a normal ocular globe of a dog. This is the cornea, this is the sclera, this is the vitreous and the retina. This is the lens, and this is the iris tissue, and this is the ciliary body right here. So the ciliary body is the area where the aqueous humor is produced, and the aqueous humor flows through the pupil, goes to the anterior chamber, and is mainly drained through the iridocorneal angle. So the objective of, of this technique is to destroy parts of the ciliary body using the laser uh, through the sclera, okay? It's a no-invasive procedure. So let's watch it. So the video is... Uh, in another dog, as a four-year-old Samoyeda, just to show you the guys the technique. Oh, sorry. So uh, for the ocular disinfection, use a five percent iodine. Uh, the glaucoma probe is from Iridex. The technique is uh, you burn the ciliar body three to four millimeters posterior to the limbus. And you, you got to wetting the uh, cornea constantly with saline solution because uh, the laser burns and it gets hot, okay? So this is the laser that we use for the procedure. And usually you treat uh, 24 spots. So this is the ocular disinfection. See that the eye is a little bit both thalmic already. So this is other case just to show you guys the, the technique, okay? This is not the case that I'm presenting to you. I'm showing this video of other cases just to show the technique. And this is the probe that you use. So Uh, this probe has this plate here, so this measures 3 millimeters and this one is 4 millimeters. When you have a normal eye that is not that buffthalmic, you go 3 millimeters posterior to the limbus. If the eye is very buffthalmic, enlarge it, you use a 4 millimeters measurement, okay? So the laser goes through the, the sclera and you burn the ciliar body in different points. So usually we do 12 points on the upper part of the globe and 12 points on the lower part of the globe. Okay.
and then at, at the end of the procedure after you're done with your burning you drain a little bit of the aqueous humor with the So at the end of the procedure, you drain a little bit of the aqueous humor using a insulin syringe. With usually we drain like 0.3 ml or so. And we use betametasone, 0.3 ml of betametasone, it's a corticosteroid to fight the inflammation. So this is the final aspect, okay? So we are trading glaucoma for uveitis with this procedure. So you're going to be very hard on the anti-inflammatory drugs after the procedure. So back to the case. This is five days uh, post laser. And owner called me over the phone and told me that the cornea was look, looks like the Pão de Açúcar in Rio de Janeiro, just like that. So this is a keratoconus and was uh, talking about this case with other vets that do the procedure more than 10 years already. They told me they never had a case just like that. So uh, keratoconus induced by laser. So we have to deal with that. The therapeutic plan in this case uh, was cross-linking and third eye lead compression flap. So the cross linking technique is showed here. We're not gonna go over the cross linking technique. And this is the third eye lead compression flap. The flap is anchored on the bulbar conjunctiva, just like I'm showing you guys here. So talk a little bit about the cross linking. The cross linking increases the corneal biomechanical stability. So this is a normal cornea, and this is a cornea treated with cross-linking. Uh, cross-linking helps uh, eliminate microorganisms and helps, helps the corneum, with the corneal melting. This is 20 days post-operative -oper after cross-linking and the third eye lead compression flap. So we have a nice transparency. The eye is calm, is visual and the intraocular pressure is 15 millimeters of mercury. So it was a very good outcome. And uh, I would like to share this case with you guys to show the cyclophotocoagulation technique and this uh, keratoconus uh, complication that we had and we managed with uh, cross-linking and third eyelid flap. So this is follow-up uh, four months. We have a, lip, a faint corneal edema in, on the right eye. Eye is still visual, the eye is calm, and intraocular pressure is 16 and to 20 millimeters of mercury. So any question about this other case? So Dr. Pedro, Pedro is asking how long could you keep the IOP down? You mean after the laser? I didn't understand your question. Or after the laser, you talking about uh, keeping the drugs after the laser? Is that what you're talking about? Dr. Fernanda is asking what is the rate of corneal ulcer after the procedure? None. Never had a corneal ulcer after laser.
the red laser is only only reacts with tissue with pigment so the cornea is transparent so there's no reaction with the laser okay So, Dr. Pedro, after the laser, how many months did the IOP stay down with drugs? After the laser, we you need to worry about the uveitis, okay? And uveitis, you have a hypotony. So, the pressure is always low. So, that's what I'm talking about. You trade the disease. You switch the glaucoma uh, for the, the uveitis. Usually, you just use uh, anti-inflammatory drugs after the procedure. You don't keep the, the dog on any other uh, anti-glaucoma drugs, okay? Thanks, Fernanda. Any more questions about this one? So, no more questions, let's move over to the other case. So, this is the last case I'm going to show you guys this morning. This is a three-year-old Shih Tzu. This is the left eye, this is the right eye. So, the right eye sustain a very bad perforation. And we have iris tissue here, a lot of melting. So this is a, a case that we have to put some graft or do a procedure that gives the full thickness of the cornea back, okay? So in this case, the therapeutic plane was total penetrating keratoplasty and we use frozen cornea to do this transplant uh, we have here watching this video dr carolina barbosa she does a lot of penetrating keratoplasty in her uh, veterinary ophthalmology service in campo grande and she has a lot of good results this cornea uh, was a gift from her and we're gonna watch the technique here and I'm gonna talk through the video for you guys so this is a total penetrating keratoplasty so guidelines for this procedure Cornea tissues obtained from deceased dogs, okay? And the cornea should be harvested in at least six hours. You wash it off the cornea with saline solution, put inside a tobramycin eye drop vial, store in a freezer, and you defrost three hours before using it. So 
it's very easy to obtain the donor tissue and to store it. For this procedure, you gotta have the three fine system. So the donor should be 0.5 millimeters larger than the recipient bed. So when you, you have the three fine, this one is for the recipient bed and this one is for the donor, okay? So this is the, the cornea that we harvest from the seas dogs. And you put this cornea, frozen cornea that defrosted already in this device here, activated. So you have 7.5 millimeters of the donor cornea. This is for preparation of the recipient bed. So it's seven millimeters wide. Okay, so the donor should be always 0. 0.0 millimeters larger than the recipient bed. So this video is about the case that I showed you guys previously. It's a three year old Shih Tzu with severe corneal perforation and melting already. So see how severe the lesion is. We have some iris tissue showing up there. This is a picture from the side. So we have a thalamia already. This is a melting of the cornea, okay? And this is the aspect during the surgery. So with the recipient tree find, we prepare the area. And then with a diamond blade and corneal transplant scissors, we remove all this necrotic tissue. all the, the vitalized cornea and everything to just to prepare the bed for the implant okay again gotta be careful not to touch the anterior capsule of the lens remove a little bit of the blood clots there. This is special scissors for corneal transplant. We got a right angle and left angle. Some very nice scissors. This is the kind of surgery that takes a while. So this is the donor cornea, okay? It's very thick because it's about two to three times thicker than the original cornea because it absorbs uh, the turbamycin solution. And here we are removing the corneal endothelium and decimate membranes. And then we put this part. So the stroma facing down, okay? See how nice it is the, the cornea, the donor cornea when you use the tree fine for this. So here you can use a 9 o nylon or 10 o nylon. Usually I do uh, four cardinal sutures, just like in six o'clock, 12 o'clock, nine o'clock and three o'clock, just like so. And then I put continuous sutures filling the gaps. This 
So this procedure takes a while because there's a lot of sutures for you to put and the preparation and everything else takes a while. So those are the cardinal points and then I put a fill the gaps with uh, continuous pattern. Okay, and this is the final aspect. Okay, after suturing uh, the donor graft, usually I do a temporary tarsorafi for and leave this stitch here for at least 10 days to protect the area and post-op anti-inflammatory no steroidal drugs antibiotics midriacil for at least five to seven days okay And after uh, maybe a week or so, I start uh, cyclosporine, 2% cyclosporine in sesame seed oil, three times a day. And then after healing, uh, topical corticosteroids. Any questions about this procedure? So you should remove the endothelial and decimal membranes because endothelial is the part that causes more uh, rejection. We always have rejection in corneal transplant in dogs. Okay, some cases you have a very good transparency, and others you have a, a nice result, but you always have rejection. Anterior chamber during the surgery is maintained with, uh, in this case, I didn't worry about this. Just put some uh, saline solution and that's it. Sometimes you can use uh, viscoelastic, but you gotta remove the viscoelastic at the end of the surgery. So in this case, considering that the, we don't have, didn't have the collapse of the anterior chamber, we just use a saline solution. Any more questions? Dr. Carolina Barbosa, I want to share some of your experiences with those cases.
Yes, we can so we're uh, talking about all the drugs, all the uh, management post-operatively. So after three to four weeks, we put the dog under anesthesia, remove the stitches and start uh, topical steroids, okay? So I think that was it for today, guys. I really appreciate you being here with me during this quarantine period, learning about veterinary ophthalmology. Those are the social media, media channels that you can follow my work. We have the Instagram here, the Facebook page, and our website that has a lot of videos, a lot of articles about veterinary ophthalmology and the YouTube channel that you are watching this webinar today is VetWeb Veterinary Ophthalmology just keep following my work and we're gonna do more webinars in the future and for those that doesn't know our digital atlas just log into uh, vetiatlas.com this is a material that I share with you guys you pay just one time and you have this uh, constantly updated with nice pictures uh, high definition pictures and it's very good material for continuing education so I appreciate all the questions I appreciate you guys being here with me this morning and hope everything go back to normal soon all over the world so we can enjoy life again okay if you have any other questions just please send me by email and you have all my contact information in my website i really appreciate your kindness of being here with me today and hope to see you guys soon in the future, okay? Thank you very much. See you guys, bye bye.